Jeff Gerwich here from Modern Tactical Shooting. This video is all about this war belt and how I rigged it up for combat in Afghanistan. Plus, I'm going to touch on some other belts that are the current hotness. So let's go. So up until 2010, I'd always been using a Black Ox 2-inch wide black nylon duty belt. Uh, I had just finished being an instructor at our primary school, uh, schoolhouse in 2010, and going back to an SF team uh, at that time, war belts were becoming all the rage. And of course, a war belt is a padded belt with generally three rolls of molly webbing running along it so you can attach all your molly pouches. Now, this is circa 2010, and I know war belts have gone the way of the dodo a lot uh, in favor of the new inner outer belt combos which have been all the rage the last five years but i'll cover these later right now i do want to highlight the war belt why were they so popular for a time and actually why if i had to go into full-blown combat i would still grab this war belt and i would use this today now i'm going to try and make this not sound like an ats brand commercial again i've mentioned it numerous times i'm an ats brand ambassador but it was actually this war belt right here that began my relationship with ATS Tactical Gear. Again, back in 2010, I was looking for a belt. I purchased this ATS war belt with my own money. I knew the owner at the time, Mike Lose. Again, we graduated the Q course together. But for $40, which was the cost at the time, I was amazed with the price and the quality compared to other belts. You know, there's war belts out there over $100, but they all do the same thing. Really the only difference is, you know, are they made in America, made overseas, the level of padding in the belt. Uh, this I would say has a moderate amount of padding, just enough where you can feel the padding. Uh, one thing is you don't want a war belt that's over padded. One, it looks like a pillow around your waist. And two, I mean, after a period of just a few weeks, that padding is gonna break down and compress and then the belt starts sagging. And uh, really they just don't work well. So I think Again, the ATS has just the right amount of padding, and it's made in America. So for $40 at the time in 2010, uh, really it couldn't be beat. And it was after I purchased this belt, I did some reviews for Defense Review, and of course I used it on deployments, kicked off me being a brand ambassador with ATS. So let me get that out of the way now. Now, if you notice with this belt here, I do have some low pro ATS brand suspenders, and frankly, during my deployments, I always wore suspenders. I literally have no behind. It goes from back all the way down my legs. If you look at the character Stimpy from Ren and Stimpy, the back side of my body is shaped just like that. So if I put any sort of weight on a belt, I need suspenders. But the other beauty of running suspenders is, is once you put body armor on, uh, this isn't gonna push down on your belt and start dragging you down, especially with a lot of weight on here. And I'm gonna go over how I rigged this up here in a second but I thought these low pro suspenders were a must. And when I was wearing a war belt, which I didn't wear at every mission, uh, when I did wear it, it, I couldn't even feel it at all. So it was something, you know, I had it rigged up where I didn't even notice the weight. Now I don't believe in that level one, two or three tier gear system like some people follow. If I'm going into a gunfight, the first thing I'm grabbing is body armor to stop bullets coming into me. So I kept 99% of the items I needed in a gunfight on my plate carrier, which you can check out my plate carrier video, which I made a, a few months back about the plate carrier I ran in combat. But when I was wearing the full blown war belt, which was on any mission that required, uh, typically we were walking in or flying in and it was gonna be a multi-day operation because I did wanna plus up my gear. I did go with a war belt. If I was just doing a vehicle infill, Normally, I just wore a Wilderness Instructor Belt with a 1911 on my hip and two extra mags, which I covered in my M1911 video. I'll put down in the description, just like the body armor video. But uh, that was just for a simple one day or, you know, driving in and out in the same day. If it was going to be mul multiple day and I knew I was going to be a lot of doing a lot of walking, again, I went for the war belt. Now, let me change up the camera angle and I'll cover how I have this war belt rigged up. All right, so this is my war belt rigged up just like how I wore it during most of my tours in Afghanistan. I actually had a multi-cam one, but I gave that to my son. But this one's got one tour on it. Now, I'm a righty with the pistol and a lefty with the rifle, so that will explain some of my pouch setup on here. But I'll start on my strong side with the pistol. 
Now, I know drop leg holsters have fallen long out of favor. I think I was honestly the last guy in SF to be rocking a drop leg, even in 2015. If you look at this photo here of some of my team members' war belts, my belt's at the top in a drop leg. Everybody else by 2014 was rocking drop offsets for the most part. Uh, when war belts started to really be become popular in 2010, that's when Safariland was actually launching a few different items at the same time. One, of course, was the ALS thumb brake or thumb lever style as opposed to the SLS hood. Also, this QLS mount, which allows you to pop the holster off and switch it to other platforms. And they came out with the drop offset mounts. Now, I grew up in SF rocking a Safariland 6004 SLS model with the hood. And I'm, I was just so used to it, super comfortable running it. You know, that's just what I stuck with even up until my last tour in Afghanistan. I've given drop offsets an honest try, but they just never seemed comfortable for me. Even sitting down, they, they tend to poke the pistol up and ride against you. And one thing I liked about drop leg holsters, if you look at this photo here from Helmand, Afghanistan, when it's attached to your leg, it kind of conforms with your leg and bends when you sit down and bend over and stuff. And the key to running a drop leg is to not take the name literally like some army guys like to do and in a lot of action movies and wear it just above your kneecap. If you look how high I have the butt of the pistol where it's actually right at the edge of the belt line, it's just low enough to clear the lip of your body armor and that's where you want it to be. If you marry this up with a drop offset, this actually rides higher than some guys' drop offsets. I just need it low enough to clear the body armor I wore one leg strap and I wore it pretty loose just so I could, you know, the pistol wouldn't go anywhere if I needed to draw it. But I could walk for a, a three-day mission and it would not bother me. I know drop legs are totally out of fashion now. Offsets are the, you know, are the, the way to go. But that's just something I preferred and it worked for me. And again, you know, 20, I had 19 years of rocking a, a drop leg and that's just what I'm comfortable with. Moving on. This is my primary speed reload. I've always worn one on the back of my belt, just behind my pistol. Because again, I'm a lefty with a rifle. So my right hand is actually my support hand. And this is where my rapid reload would be. Range training it would be there. And that way when I threw on full kit, even with mags in the front, uh, I know I had at least one on my back for a fast reload. Dump pouch, my primary method of reloading in actual firefights was to try and tack reload and never run my rifle dry. But sometimes it can't be helped and sometimes when you're trying to gain suppressive fire, you're really laying down the lead and just throwing your empties on the ground. You don't have time to pick them up. Uh, once you gain that fire superiority or you get done doing your business, I could go back and pick up the empties, throw them in the dump pouch. But also, uh, if I needed to plus up with certain things, it's just a handy pouch to have on you. Uh, back in the Iraq days, every every house had a metal door, so we used a lot of water impulse charges. So even if I wasn't the primary breacher, I could throw an extra 500 milliliter water impulse charge in here and not have to rearrange my entire kit to have space for extra charges. So a dump pouch is always something handy. Now this next pouch is the one I could never do without. This is actually an old Eagle Industries pouch. It was an Alice Clip version. I modified it. This is my Nods pouch. So, of course, at night you have your nods on your helmet. I did not like to walk around with nods on top of my helmet all the time. So as soon as the sun came up, I'd take off my PVS-31s so as they go in this pouch. And that way my nods were always on my body. You can't rely on keeping items you need inside of a go bag or a three-day pack because you truly might not see that pack again. You have to have your nods on you at all times. So this was my pouch for that. Next, of course, a multi-tool. Needs no explanation, uh, just super handy. This is an AR specific one, so it does have some M4 style tools in it, like a front sight pulse tool and things like that. An old school Surefire G2Z polymer light I got in 2004. It's been on my belt ever since. I never rocked a white light on my pistol on the Beretta because it was a pain to always put on there. You can, you can be done. But uh, even though this is an incandescent bulb, it's maybe 80 lumens. It still gets the job done. It will light up a target at room distance. And uh, I've used, I pulled my pistol one time indoors at CQB distance and it was dark and I did actually go to this. Uh, so it's been used once, but uh, yeah, G2Z. 
Lastly, nine mil or extra magazine pouches. I've had at least, always at least two. Now this triple taco, I actually got after my last tour, so I never used it in combat. During my time in Afghanistan, I rocked either the Eagle issued ones or other brand ones that had a flap. And the reason why is when you're bending over, you're IMTing, running around, ducking for cover, sometimes the lips of the base pads can catch uh, on the edge of your body armor on our other things and pull your mags out. I've had that happen to me downrange where I've lost one or two pistol mags. Especially, you know, you go on a 3A op, you helicopter in, super tight quarters, you're running around during those three days, low crawling and all that. I've just lost mags, so I've always gone to a flat version to retain them. I'd rather have to worry about getting past this flap to do a reload than reach for a re reload and find out, you know, there's no mags there whatsoever. So, of course, on the flat range, open tops are faster, but for practicality, I went with flaps. And the last item on this belt is behind my Nods pouch is a cold steel push dagger. And I've had this since 1994. I used to wear it behind my one quart canteen pouch on the old Alice gear. It's been with me on every tour but Desert Storm and it's really my weapon of last resort. I always had a some sort of knife on the front of my body armor. I've always worn this behind my left hip. It's between the pouch and the belt and really if I couldn't get to the knife on the front of my kit I had this behind me and it's a it, the means of last resort I'm not a knife fighter I'm not going to fight it out but if I ever got tackled and if I was just down to you know my left hand being free especially if it was stuck behind me I had an option of going for this making space so I could get back to a rifle or pistol and finishing the fight so this is my weapon of last resort, cold steel push dagger. But this was my basic belt setup uh, for all three of my tours in Afghanistan where I rocked a war belt. Now one thing I also did uh, 2010 up to about 2015 is I ran, because I had a multicam one, I had it rigged up for combat. This uh, flat dark earth one, I actually had it rigged up at the time for competitive shooting. I did want the belt I wore in combat to match what I used for range training and competitive shooting. So I actually ran this belt in three gun and two gun matches. Uh, again, at the time, circa 2010 to 2015, you could get Molly adapters to fit your competitive style pouches on here. And of course, at the time, we were still doing the uh, quad loads. We weren't doing the load two or load four, so you could get quad load adapters so you can put the quad load pouches on a war belt. So I rocked this rigged up for three gun and I did run a drop leg at the time. Now duty wise, because I had a Beretta, I had that SLS holster, but I started running specifically an ALS holster for three gun. And of course, eventually I switched again to all team Glock. Uh, once again, ALS holster is the duty standard. There's no holster better on the market, I think, for tactical work. And for three gun, because it has great retention, I was a big favor of using it there also. So I didn't have to worry about running uh, in super fast sprints and my pistol falling out. You see guys even today in three gun and two gun comp competition, when they go to run a long distance, they put one hand on their holster because they're worried about their gun falling out. If you can't get both arms going in a sprint, you know, you're just not moving as fast as you can. So I'd rather have a holster that might be 0.3 seconds slower on the draw because you have to activate a piece of retention. Then worry about it in the back of my mind while I'm shooting a stage if my pistol is going to fall out. If it does fall out, you're kicked out of the match. So activating the ALS lever is no big deal to me. And with training, you don't even notice it and it doesn't really even slow you down. So that is the war belt. Now, 2015, again, is the last time I rocked a war belt. Most of my team members were running war belts at the time, too. But again, the last five years, we've seen the inner outer belt combo uh, take hold within the military world within special operations. Now, inner outer belt combos, they are nothing new. What is an inner outer belt combo? It's a belt that has an inner belt that actually loops to you around your, your pants. 
and then you put this belt with the hook pile tape or Velcro around it. They've been in use forever. Law enforcement has been using inner outer belt combos for all of eternity, as well as competitive shooters. When I first got into competitive shooting and USPSA style shooting back in 2000, the first belt I purchased for my 1911, I was shooting what's known as limited 10 at the time. I bought an inner outer belt combo. Generally in competitive shooting, the buckles are in the back so you can wear pouches all across the front. But in the last five years, I'm actually happy to see these have caught on in the military and gear companies are making inner outer belt combos. So I think that's a good thing and that's just one of our option. I think there's pros to cons to running a war belt or an inner outer belt combo for combat and I'll get into that right now. So the biggest complaint about war belts is they are the, probably the most bulky belt, belt out there with the padding, the three rows of molly. So some guys actually do not like the bulkiness of the war belt. Hence uh, the inner outer belt combo because the tactical ones are only two rows of molly. They're a lot slimmer. And because you are wearing the inner belt going through your belt loops and this is velcroed around, they are a lot sturdier uh, and more rigid. Uh, this is an ATS skirmish belt, which I prototyped the very first one, and I've got it rigged up uh, how I run it for the flat range. And then later they came out with their skirmish belt. They basically took and made it twice as rigid. Uh, shooters wanted an even more rigid belt. And actually rigid is better when you're talking about speed, and I'll get into that in a second. And this is again rigged up. This is the belt I mainly use if you come to any of my courses and you see me out in the range instructing, this will probably be the belt I'm wearing. But the reason why rigid belts are good, and I talked a little bit about it with the war belt because the material is on the outside. When you go to pull pouches, there is a little give in the fabric. So it's not, it works, but it's not super crisp. There is a little bit of give because it's attached to this molly panel. Whereas a super rigid war belt when you've got, or super rigid style inner outer belt combo, uh, when it's around your waist, this is super rigid and provides for a super crisp, clean draw. And you want that in competition definitely because, you know, tenths of a second count. Same thing when you go to retrieve um, magazines, with it being rigid, these just pop right out and there's zero give. So that is one benefit of the inner outer belt combo. And that's why they're a favorite in competitive style shooting, whether it's three gun, two gun, single gun, inner outer belt combos are the belt system to go with. Now the cons to an inner outer belt combo, I think is comfort. I can wear this war belt for up to three days, it was my longest mission on the ground in Afghanistan. And I had it rigged up with the suspenders. I wore the holster loose on my leg. I didn't even notice it. So I would not notice this belt at all. There's photos of me when I did take naps and sleep. I dropped my body armor. I'd sleep with my war belt on. So if I had to get up and go, at least I had that on me. Uh, I, these inner outer belt combos, I think would get old after a while. Now I have not rocked one in combat, but if I were going on a multi-day op, because this is, you gotta wear these pretty tight around your waist to keep any sort of uh, weight, weighted items if this is fully loaded around your waist. I think these would get old after a while. I don't think I'd wanna do a two or three day op wearing a very rigid, non-flexible inner outer belt combo. One reason, again, why we didn't, the, the Blackhawk two inch nylon duty belts went away and war belts came in in the first place. One reason it's comfort. You have to cinch those down around your waist really tight to keep all that stuff in place. And after two, three days on the ground doing patrols, that feels like a tourniquet around your waist. And I think wearing one of these would have the same effect. Awesome range belts. And if I was a member of a police or a tactical, some sort of you know tactical team with short duration missions, I think the inner outer belt combo is the way to go.
So there it is. That covers my war belt I used in Afghanistan, my thoughts on tactical belts in general. Inner outer belt combos are pretty nice. I think for a lot of shooters, they are the way to go, obviously, because they are the hot belt right now. Most of your SF guys, special operation guys, if you see them out and about, they're probably wearing an inner outer belt combo. For me, again, if I had to deploy, if I was called up right now back to active duty, I would grab my trusty war belt uh, because with body armor and the way I have it rigged up, the comfort cannot be beat, especially if I'm gonna be out on the ground for two or three or four days. I think this is the way to go, but it's all personal preference and really what you find best. Ulti ideally, have multiple belts so you have options if that's feasible. Uh, if you're just looking for, hey, I'm going to do some range training, some tactical courses once in a while, shoot some matches once in a while, I gotta say the inner and outer belt combo is the way to go. This will do you well. I just wanted to cover war belts and why they were so popular uh, for a period of time within Special Forces. So there you have it. That's all about belts. My preference, SF war belt in combat. As always, enough watching me. Go out, hit the range, uh, reconfigure your belt for optimum shooting. Try different belts. Find the one that works for you the best. I'm Jeff Gerwich. Thanks for watching.